bringing any product to market is a difficult challenge, but doing so with a motor vehicle has, carries with it a lot of its own unique and very um, difficult challenges. You look at the history of motorcycling, you know, there are more failed motorcycle brands than there are existing ones, especially in America. It's really kind of counterintuitive to start a small displacement motorcycle manufacturing company up in America. But there's a huge need for people who don't want big bikes, they don't want fast bikes. They want something that's beautiful, something that gives a riding experience unlike anything else you can buy out there. And I feel like at Janus, that's what we provide. I remember the very first time like I ever saw Richard. I've only talked to him on the phone, but he pulled off of uh, the, the main street outside the moped shop and he came around the corner and there's this six foot six guy on the, the smallest moped that you can imagine, this tiny Gorelli top tank. And I thought, what a wonderful, ridiculous looking thing that is. <laughs> the whole combination, him and the bike. And sure enough, he chose that bike on purpose. I ended up buying a 1978 Gorelli Super Sport, which is like a little teeny motorcycle. It's just perfect, beautiful little bike. Um, and so shortly after purchasing that, I moved out here to uh, Indiana. And shortly after getting here, uh, you know, it wasn't working as best as it should. Lo and behold, there was a Moped Army chapter not half an hour away from uh, where South Bend, Indiana, where I was in school. And so I rode the bike out there, uh, and I think by the time I reached Devin's shop, Motion Left Mopeds, I was doing about 10 miles an hour, and yes, vintage mopeds are slow, but they're not that slow. <laughs> and I rolled it in and immediately was just struck with the kind of aura of Devin's shop, which was just this really cooperative, honest, open, Midwestern uh, little, little shop on the side of the road. Picked the bike up, you know, super lightweight. Uh, picked it up, put it on the bench, and went through it. And you know, Devin was instantly able to to uh, diagnose what was wrong and get it back in shape. And I was able to ride home. I had so much fun there. I thought, well, you know, they do these weekly rides. I'll, I'll join in that. I was instantly kind of thrown into this this culture of, of of vintage mopeds. Gradually got to know Devin more through that process. Shortly thereafter, I guess the next summer, I started uh, working there with, with Devin. Um, we were doing basically kind of resto mods on some vintage bikes, and then a couple of really neat custom projects. I think that at that point, the, cu the custom motorcycle scene really didn't, didn't exist like it does today. Creating this custom project where you can actually charge people uh, you know, a, a good amount of money for this thing, and getting some higher profile clients was, was really unique and he kind of spearheaded that in the United States at least. The moment I realized that Richard had this creativity in him that I just, I didn't have was um, when he wanted to put a fender from another bike onto this one bike we were doing and suspend it in this weird way and I just instantly thought that's a really great idea because I sometimes have a very like singular mindset when it comes to restoring the bikes and I want to keep them you know a certain way true to the you know the way the manufacturer made them but when he came in and he just threw like kind of that, that twist on it it kind of uh, opened I guess opened the doors to a whole new light of how we were going to do things. So Richard got his bachelor's uh, in literature in this tiny school out of New England. Um, and then shortly after he graduated from there, he went to grad school at Notre Dame, where he uh, ended up graduating with his master's in classical architecture. It's always been a really special pleasure for me to work with Devin, because Devin brings a very different way of looking at the world than I do. Um, he 
He's a high school graduate. He thought about going to art school, but decided that he would rather start his own business. This extremely intelligent guy that is just wants to work with his hands and, and build beautiful things, uh, practical things. Um, I think that that's something that we really are missing um, nowadays. Richard's able to bring a real brilliant aesthetic to the bikes because of his education and his background in architecture. Yeah, it's a nice interchange and, and I think we've worked out a really good symbiotic relationship where um, we can really bring in some of those kind of more uh, design-oriented decisions with more kind of fabrication, practical building. A lot of what we do now is does have its moped like heritage in there. The simplicity and the lightweight nature of, of these mopeds, they, they just allowed you to do things that you can't do on big bikes and have fun in different ways. The idea that you can wrench on a bike, that everything is accessible. You do not have to take classes. You really don't even have to have a manual most of the time to rip apart your carburetor, take off your cylinder head, and you can usually do it with the toolkit that they supply you, you know, when you buy a moped or when it was purchased back in the 70s. That kind of simplicity has always played a huge influence on the way we design and the way we build our bikes. Because there's almost nothing more incredible than riding a bike, but also being able to repair it. It took me a long time to understand why I loved two-wheeled vehicles, especially like small two-wheeled vehicles, why I loved them so much. I came to realize that my whole life I've always had these dreams where, like most people do, where you're flying. But I was never flying up in the sky, I was always flying just above, you know, the, the ground. And it wasn't until, like, I got on a moped that I actually got to feel what I felt in the dream, like the best feeling in the world of flying. I got to feel that on two wheels and feel that all the time. And so that feeling, I can't get it anywhere else. I, I've tried, it's only on small bikes do I get that feeling. It's the closest I can get to flying. Both of Devin and I are just fascinated with that pairing of form and function that you get, especially on a motorcycle, but especially on a lightweight, stripped down, small displacement bike where it's just fun. And that's where the, for our days in mopeds have taught us. Around the time that I started visiting uh, Devin's shop, Motion Left Mopeds, his business was kind of going through a transformation. He was, before that, basically doing refurbishing bikes. He'd done really well with that. I mean, he, he self-employed, just uh, running in this moped shop. And, uh, but he was starting to get more interested in uh, bigger ideas. And so those custom bikes were a beginning point. And then, uh, right around that point, he started looking into what people needed. These old bikes were putting out way more horsepower than they were in the uh, when they were designed for, with cylinder kits, uh, larger carburetors, improved clutches, um, and getting. I mean, one of his builds, you know, started out at two, two and a half horsepower, and was dynoed at 14 horsepower, and capable of 70 plus miles an hour. Um, it's all on a single centrifugal clutch. <laughs> I think that's pretty pretty amazing. So, yeah, through through that process, he started looking at manufacturing some of these things. And one of the products that he started working on um, were, were exhaust systems for vintage two-strokes. By the second year, I had been uh, working with Devin. His he was basically a nationally known name in this in the vintage two-stroke moped world. Um, you talk about a motion left exhaust and people are like, oh yeah, those are really good. So at a certain point of building so many custom mopeds and having pretty good success with it, uh, I th we, we kind of just felt like we were reaching a stopping point with what you could do to a moped. Uh, and so we just decided to make a custom bike, the Paragon. The entire idea was to create something new, to create something that we can call ours. You know, spending years wrenching on somebody else's um, ideas, somebody else's craftsmanship. Uh, it just, it's hard to connect to that over and over and over when you feel like there can be so much more and so many new things added to the experience. We had the idea, you know, to build at least five of the Paragons and just see what we could do. We basically set out to do an actual 50cc like GP bike. Over that spring, um, in my free time in school, I was able to 
draw up some plans for a frame um, and uh, fuel tank, seat, kind of a rough idea, the basic proportions, wheelbase, that kind of thing, all built around a vintage uh, Pook E50 motor. We ended up starting to think about building that and sourcing those parts. And one of the uh, first places we, we kind of heard about was a, an Amish fabrication shop. We heard they had basically made their, manufactured their own bicycles. And they also had worked with um, some race car chassis. But we went in there, just a couple naive guys with a drawing <laughs> saying, can you build this frame? And so uh, about two weeks later, we had a frame in, uh, in our hands. At that point, we knew how to make the exhaust from doing the moped exhausts. But nobody knew how to build a gas tank. Nobody knew how to build a seat. We didn't know how to make the handlebars. And we still had no idea how the manufacturing process worked. So we were like, you know, we asked everybody, can you make a gas tank? Everybody said no. We have no idea how we're gonna form all these complex curves. And I remember one day I got fed up with like people telling me no, and I just went in with the paper templates, traced it onto a sheet of aluminum, jigsawed it out, and just started hammering. And uh, got a pretty decent shape of a tank out of that. <laughs> but it was, uh, and then Richard, I remember he came in, and it, the two of us, we were able to actually figure out how to hammer the tank into something usable. And we did the same thing with the seat. What happened simultaneously was um, Devin took his exhausts to them and said, hey, what would it take for you all to manufacture these for me? And we took them all of our wooden forms and we even took our table out there, I believe at the time, the, the hammering table, which is this like braced table that could handle all the abuse we gave it and basically showed them, you know, here's a cone, you know, it comes from the laser cutter like this. You wrap it around, you know, set it on top of this wooden form, and then you, you, know, you hammer it like this, and just kind of showed them that. And lo and behold, you know, a week later, they were teaching us how to do it better. <laughs> and so right away, they were able to do it and put out more volume because we couldn't keep up with the demand for these exhausts. And uh, so very quickly, Devin's business just uh, really exploded, and we were introduced to the concept of really manufacturing, and we were learning from these uh, Luddite Amish, what that actually means and about efficiency. And a big part of making a beautiful product is making sure that it's efficiently done. It's not gonna ever go anywhere if you can't, if, it, if it's not a practical. Little did we know that in the, the plans to build five of these, this was actually the foundation of Janus. This was the, the start of Rich and I collaborating on not just one bike, but an idea of building many bikes. The Paragon was sort of was like, oh wow, we can, we can do this, um, let's see what we can do next. So that one bike turned into the idea of a, well, maybe we'll do one with a, an actual gearbox, not a centrifugal clutch. So we, we sourced a bunch of different motors, we're like looking at which ones we could do, and finally we, we ended up with a little, still a two-stroke, because that's kind of where we were, our backgrounds were in, um, but uh, it's based on a, it's a Derby uh, 50. It's like a little sport bike over in Europe. Found this a six-speed, water-cooled, uh, case-inducted, little two-stroke, just powerhouse, just an incredible little motor. And we're like, well, let's build a framer on this thing and see where we go. And I'd done a lot of research, you know, after that, and 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 uh, learned a lot about frames and motorcycle history. And I decided that something based on the Norton Featherbed frame would probably be a good place to start because that's one of the most popular frames historically. It's kind of like the beginning of real full suspension, and it's a proven frame. We know it works. So, designed a double cradle, feather bed style frame, and uh, our plan was always to make something like the Paragon, you know, like, a, like the 50cc GP classes from the 60s and 70s, because there's that, like we were talking about, that, that moped vibe. But I was fascinated with that early pairing of like Harley Davidson, those beginning bikes, those Indians, those, even those Triumphs, those early bikes, the way that the form and function were paired and the, the, the beauty of those things, they're, just, they're so striking. And so the first one we actually did was, we called it the Halcyon, and that's kind of came out of my appreciation for those, those 1920s bikes. And we built one and started, started our business. And the goal is let's see if we can sell some of these things. And lo and behold, it took off. We built those for three years. Um, in every generation we did, in every batch we did, we would change everything. We'd improve it, you know, try and, uh, you know, work on you know, side stands and 
all these technology that we're kind of catching up with from the 1950s on. <laughs> so uh, that was that was a really amazing process, and, a, and, a, and it created a bike that's really, uh, I think, kind of basically the Halcyon 250 is very much a product of that of that early uh, two stroke. So one of the important things if you're fascinated with being a vehicle manufacturer is to uh, come up with a really good name. Paragon was the name of our, our uh, first frame and build and we thought that would be a really great name. It would be uh, reminiscent of some of these early uh, Zenith, you know, Apex, all these kind of Acme, these great, you know, the best. When we did a name search, Paragon has been used like 15 million times in every industry. So we had to come up with something different and all the good names with motorcycles were taken up by all these like now defunct companies in England. Like, there were so many motorcycle manufacturers uh, at the beginning of the last century and, and up until the 30s. Um, so it was kind of hard, but I think I was looking out the window, washing dishes, and oh, Janus, the Roman god of the road, of the past and the future, is the two-faced god that looks both directions. It really struck a chord with me and with Devin. It, it really references what we're trying to do, which is look to all of motorcycling history for our next model, not just the one that's next door or the competitive model to the one that the other company is coming out with, but looking back at everything and saying, what is what, were the, what was the high point of motorcycling? You know, where, where, where has it really done it best? And let's take that and improve on it, all within the framework of our lightweight, simple, fun mantra. Our second um, kind of round, we, we moved to a, the 250cc uh, version of the Halcyon and then introduced, finally, a bike that we've had plans for for a long time, the Phoenix. The Phoenix, to us, is just a, a kind of a tribute to the early race bikes. We're trying to provide our vision of what we see a cafe racer being. The Halcyon 250 is really Richard's brainchild, his vision of what his ideal motorcycle is. And that bike really is greatly inspired by the, the greats of Indian and Bruff Superior Zenith. Much like many of the early uh, vehicle motorcycle companies around the world, we uh, bring in our, our engine. We, we talk a lot about simplicity and what our bikes really need is a reliable, simple motor. And that motor is the, is the motor we use right now. Our engine's a 229cc motor that also has a balance shaft on the front, so it really smooths that single cylinder out, and we're, we're, we're uh, really impressed. On the 50cc Halcyon, we were using the standard telescopic forks. Uh, we had a lot of issues uh, with quality control. They were very expensive and very hard to source in. So when we went to design the 250s, uh, Richard had the idea to let's just make our own and Richard suggested using a leading link fork. Uh, it's kind of an older design, but we've been able to adapt it to fit the function of the bike perfectly. Uh, the largest benefit of us manufacturing our forks is that we can control the quality um, and we can also do rapid prototyping. We've already been through four generations of these forks. Over the last year, we've been working very close with Icon Suspension to develop the perfect shock for the front and rear of our bike, um, and that entails the, the right spring rate, the right damping, the overall length. Uh, they've been a huge help, and they were able to provide us with a shock designed specifically for JS motorcycles. When we designed the Halcyon, we always had a vision of adding a sidecar to it, and some of the best forks you can have for a sidecar are the leading link forks. So in the future, as we develop the sidecar, we already have the, the front suspension that can handle it. For our wheels, we decided to go with Pro Wheels out of Washington State. Uh, we worked closely with them to develop a proprietary wheel set and also a custom rotor for the front and back of our bikes. We've received a lot of feedback over the years from the 
the owners of the 50cc bikes and one of the first things is that they want to see the brakes improved uh, upon and we had a standard drum brake uh, front and rear. So we wanted to take extra care on the 250s to provide the best braking we could. So on the front we put a 250 millimeter rotor with a dual piston caliper and on the rear we used a 220 millimeter rotor with a single piston caliper just to add the extra confidence in stopping. And with those two models, we've had a lot of success, um, a lot of really good feedback, and we're tuning them. Um, each generation of bikes that comes out is going to have you know, more improvements. Entering the world of production is a whole nother idea of how things are done. Because not only do you have to make a part perfect and make it work in harmony with everything else, you have to make it that same way a hundred times. In a hundred years, we want these jazz bikes to be still cruising the streets. We've learned a lot about what it means to be in manufacturing from our Amish network of craftsmen. Everything goes through uh, laser cutting, all the different processes, machining. Most of our, our, our network here in northern Indiana is very familiar with that and they, they're all, they know how to efficiently get a product to market. There's no doubt about it. We are so proud to be a northern Indiana based company and making a Midwest based product. Like almost everything we source is from the Midwest. Without this industry surrounding us, I'm not sure if we could do it. Because um, it's, it's a challenge to do so many things from plating and powder coating and fabrication and laser cutting. And when everything's literally right down the road from you know, the next shop, there's probably nowhere else in the world that's like that. So Northern Indiana is a unique place for its manufacturing resources, but it's also a really amazing place to live. Devin was born and raised here in Northern Indiana and has raised his son and started a family here in Goshen. While I was in school here, I ended up meeting my wife Amy here. She's from Goshen and we We've started a family here. We have uh, three girls. Our children are a big part of Janus. Uh, they're running in and out of the shop on a daily basis, uh, very familiar with motorcycles. And um, this, the whole community of Goshen is extremely supportive of what we're doing. They have played an integral role in the success of Janus motorcycles so far. One of our core objectives in all of our design and manufacturing processes is it has to be relatable, it has to be understandable. When a person rides a Janus or just even looks at a Janus, we want them to see the parts. So we, we have a rule that we don't cover anything up. Everything's exposed, so therefore everybody can understand what's happening. It makes it very approachable because you can understand it. We believe in small displacement. We believe in lightweight, manageable bikes that anybody can understand. What we're trying to create is a motorcycle that is fully accessible, that's just fun. You don't have to jump over the hurdle of being able to keep the front wheel on the ground or you don't have to go out and buy a set of leather pants. You can just experience what it is to be on a motorcycle and have that fun. We get so many people that say, I've never been interested in motorcycles, I've never appreciated motorcycles until, hey, I saw this picture of a Janus and I'm like, I need to learn, know more about what's, what is this? You know, maybe, maybe I could actually, maybe I'm, a, maybe I want to be a motorcyclist. <laughs> you know, maybe I want to ride one of these. Or maybe it doesn't matter if I want to be a motorcyclist. I want to ride a motorcycle. That's all it takes. And uh, I think that's what, that's what Janus is all about.